Okay, so here we go. Uh, I want to share with you a quotation from the Buddha Dharma. And what I'm going to start doing as of tonight, and I'll continue this next week, is for every week, we'll have a short quotation that I will teach from and offer to you. And it will go out in the email that you receive uh, Wednesday morning, uh, West Coast time, uh, setting, giving you the link for this uh, Zoom gathering. And then also, I'll send you the quotation in the follow-up email you'll get, telling you where the links are to the recorded talks if you want. So this is a very central, fundamental theme in Buddhism. Uh, because I'm getting my act together, I don't have this quotation uh, sent out to you in advance. I could put it in the chat. Yeah. Why don't I do that? Hang on. So to everyone, how do I send a chat to everyone? Okay, everyone in the meeting. Here we go. So this is a particular translation from Gil Fronstall his version of the Dhammapada. And um, this translation, some of the words are different in different translations, but the essence are the same. Here we go. Um, all created things are impermanent. Seeing this with insight, one becomes disenchanted with suffering. Okay, so I've posted it. Um, I moved my microphone away from my mouth to type. So now my microphone's back. That probably has adjusted the, uh, the sound quality here. Um, okay, that sounds good. Very good. Thanks for the input. Very good. Um, and so I'm going to read this quotation again and then unpack it because it's a fundamental, I mean, one of the most fundamental insights and teachings from the Buddha. And like many, many things that are profoundly true and consequential and valuable, it seems almost like a cliche at first, like, so what, right? But when you go more and more deeply into the words and the impact, and you really bring it close to your experience, you start to get, wow, how radical and how liberating this particular teaching is. So I want to unpack so some key words here. I want to uh, acknowledge other translations of some key words that add nuances to what we can take away from this. And I want to emphasize the experiential nature of this. So we had, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> So we have all created things are impermanent. Created is Gill's word for what is often translated as conditioned or compounded. Minimally, we're talking here about the ongoing construction of experience. So when the Buddha is talking about things, he's bringing it into our own experience, our own consciousness. He's talking about things as they appear in consciousness. So the image of the rock, distinct from the rock itself. He was a farmer, if you think about it. He was very aware of things and very grounded in dealing with things. But most fundamentally, he was speaking to our experience of things. In our consciousness, in our minds, in our ordinary experience of a rock or you know, a tickle in my throat or the feeling of drinking water, uh, he's pointing out that all experiences are constructed. They don't just exist on their own. They arise due to causes. They exist dependently, entwined with all of reality. So right there, just in the phrase, all conditioned things, all fabricated, that's sometimes another word that's used, all fabricated things, all compounded things, all of our experiences right there to appreciate that they're constructed. They rest dependently 
in all of reality. This moment of experience is reality acting locally now in our experience. And the Buddha points out that all experiences have a dynamic, transient quality. Even if they're relatively stable, they're like the standing wave of a river passing over a boulder. Yes, there is a certain continuity to the ongoingness of a sensation of pain or a certain continuity uh, uh, with regard to certain personality tendencies or certain fundamental values that a person might have. All right. But even if you look closely at, the, at a feeling like gratitude or a sensation in your knee, you can observe a dynamic, quivering, fuzzy, fuzzy, a uh, fizzing, a fizzing, effervescent quality in the experience. It has itself a transience to it. Out there in physical reality, we can also see, independent or distinct from our experiences, that most elements in physical reality are themselves impermanent as well. The rock fundamentally is impermanent. Uh, eventually, all the rocks on planet Earth will be swallowed up by our own sun as three, four, five billion years from now, fear not, it's a while in the future, will gradually consume all its internal supplies and our sun will grow to become a red giant. It will gradually expand to absorb uh, Mercury and then it'll move beyond the orbit of Mercury to Venus and then gradually expand 93 million miles out to swallow up our own planet Earth. And then after a, you know, a few million years or so, give or take, roughly, I guess, it'll then contract back and become a white dwarf. This is a normal process in the evolution of stars, but it's a way to appreciate that everything here on planet Earth is itself impermanent one way or another. As a kind of a nerdy stickler for things, I think it's interesting to recognize that there are certain things that are permanently the case, like the formula for the area of a circle on a plane is pi radius squared. The fact of impermanence is permanent, right? Good, great. Plytus, the Greek philosophers, you know, you put your finger in the river, you never put your finger in the same river twice. All right, everything's changing, so what? Well, the Buddha is deeply interested in freedom from suffering, freedom from suffering. And he points out that one of our fundamental sources of suffering is the clinging to or the attempt to possess or hold on to inherently ephemeral experiences, passing transient experiences. And where this gets um, real often is in our daily life with other people where we recognize that we get in trouble with other people when we try to hold on to our positions, our views, or our righteous case about one thing or another. Or we try to hold on to pleasures, like there we are, you know, doing something that we like, and it changes, it fades, but we still want that pleasure. We still want it back, right? Maybe we have a really nice feeling with another person. They make us feel good about ourselves. We feel loved. We feel like they care about us. And then... They move on or their attention shifts to something else. Wait a minute, I'm still here. Wait a minute, we want them to come back. And I'm not speaking against the, the natural importance of you know, wanting to have good relationships with other people and making requests of each other, but it's very interesting to observe the degree to which our suffering is grounded in trying to hold things or keep them in place when they are inherently changing. Even at the most basic level of people move on, relationships change, uh, your standing in certain situations changes over time. Um, all bleeding stops eventually, one way or another. So uh, there's a freedom in holding things more lightly and not being so attached to changing conditions. So the Buddha then goes on to say, seeing this with insight, seeing impermanence with insight. He's talking there about the word vipassana, including the kind of profound, penetrating insight that's available in meditation. Uh, during the meditation we just experienced, I was suggesting an awareness of, of things changing 
and a focusing on letting go. And as soon as you start focusing on letting go, it brings you into the sense of things changing and it brings you into the present moment. Um, and so when we see the transience of our experience, we become disenchanted. That's such an interesting word, isn't it? We wake up from the spell. We appreciate them. We like what we like. We're, we're aware of pain, but we're less bothered or agitated when we live in the present, continually letting go while receiving the next moment. It's interesting that someone uh, as great a teacher as the Zen master Suzuki Roshi, who passed away in the early 1970s. He was instrumental in, in bringing um, Zen uh, Buddhism to America, founded San Francisco Zen Center. And he said, enlightenment is, and then he finished with a phrase. And anytime a Zen master who's as precise and clear and, and kind of restrained in what he says and specific as Suzuki Roshi, Anytime a Zen master says, enlightenment is, right? It's like one of those E.F. Hutton commercials back on television a while ago. When E.F. Hutton speaks, everyone listens. Well, when Suzuki Roshi speaks, people listen. He said, enlightenment is letting go of this moment and growing into the next one. Wow. And in that, you can recognize the continuity of it because the moments are continuous. So in effect, enlightenment is an activity. It's, a, it's an ongoingness of letting go of this moment while growing into, while receiving the next one, which itself then becomes an opportunity for, which, for letting go. The next moment that we grow into woof, is woof, instantaneously let go of itself. Wow, you can start to get a feeling for that. A kind of delight comes over you. A kind of, wow, right? Whoosh, wow, whoosh. I don't even have time to make the sounds because it all happens so fast. Wow, whoosh, whoosh, wow. Whoosh, whoosh. You know, whoosh. it's really hard to suffer or get all tangled, right? How do we, we can't get all tangled up. We lighten up. We wake up from the spell when we're in the whoosh wow. Okay, that's the new, that's my new thing. Whoosh wow, wow whoosh, whoosh wow. Anyway, it's a bumper sticker for my car. I don't know, too late for that. So, as he says, all created things are impermanent. Seeing this with insight, one becomes disenchanted with suffering. That's a really, really fundamental deep teaching of the Buddha. And I wanna offer a few other quotations that relate to this uh, and offer a few practical points about bringing this out of the abstract in the lived experience um, and how to actually become more uh, comfortable with the groundlessness that we kind of start to experience when we realize that all our experiences are vanishing beneath us continuously. Even the sense of me or you know myself is itself disappearing, right? Passing away continuously. It can be kind of alarming. And so there are important ways to become more comfortable with that. Well, um, I want to offer a couple of uh, additional quotations here. From the Itu, Itu Vitaka, above, across, or back again, wherever one goes in the world, let one carefully scrutinize the rise and fall of compounded things. In other words, whether we're going into visionary experiences, whether we're eating the best spaghetti of our life, even if we are enjoying the wonderful banana bread with chocolate chips, that you happen to make a few nights ago, warmed up in a microwave with butter. Mm. In all our activities, can we continually scrutinize the rise and fall of compounded things so that in the midst of our activities, we can hold them more and more lightly as they pass through our fingers. We can hold our experiences lightly as they pass through, right? 
the Buddha is calling us to an ongoingness of this revelation, the revelation of the obviousness of impermanence and the groundlessness inherently of all our experiences. Can we be comfortable in this? Can we be at home in this airiness as we live our lives? That's what he's calling us to. Because from his standpoint, we see, and we have to see for ourselves, but from his standpoint, this is a fundamental means to the end of liberation from suffering. It's not just an abstract philosophical exercise. Oh, well, everything changes. So what? The So what of all that is that the felt, embodied, and unresisting, unlimited surrender into the dissolvingness of experience continuously. It's like a circuit breaker that frees us from clinging and suffering right in the moment, ba boom. And with practice and time, it becomes more habitual. You become arrested in the felt sense of the dissolvingness of experience and the delighted arrival of the next moment. And you start to experience yourself more and more as this mysterious, incredible process of consciousness appearing and continuing with a deep peacefulness and freedom in the middle of it. Another quotation, they do not lament over the past, they yearn not for what is to come. They maintain themselves in the present, thus their complexion is serene. So as we let go, we really come into the present. And in the present, there may be pain, but there need be no suffering. Because we're not fighting when we're in the present. The closer we get to the present, that means the more we're letting go. And the more we let go, the more we feel a freedom and a fundamental kind of peace. To be comfortable with this letting go, it's very helpful to have a sense of your going onness. You're not dying as you let go. Um, it can feel fairly alarming, especially in deep practice, to have a sense of just the impersonal vanishingness of all our experiences. And a way to help the scared animal get more comfortable with this is to appreciate the arisingness of everything and the going onness of the process of being. This sense of radical acceptance, as Tara Brock talks about it, helps us maintain a serene complexion, even as we face very difficult forms of letting go, letting go of loved ones, letting go of certain possibilities, letting go of things we wanted, as Ajahn Chah, you know, the great teacher taught, if you let go a little, you'll have a little peace. If you let go a lot, you'll have a lot of peace. If you let go completely, you'll be completely peaceful. So doing that meditation myself, you know, I'm listening to the teacher too. Uh, I was really aware of all these kind of subtle holdings on in me, you know, these or insistences. That's the way I would describe them, like a pushes or pressures, or must, nesses, must. And it's really powerful to be aware of this internal sense of must or demand that reality be a certain way or demand inside your own mind that your mind be a certain way. That's different from wholesome aspiration or the understandable longings in our heart. It's this sense of contraction and demand that is right at the heart of so much of our stress and suffering. And we can become more mindful of the somatic markers of it, the felt sense in the body of contraction, contractingness and demandingness, and in that awareness, soften around it and let it go. That's a really useful thing to observe, which can foster a serene complexion. So then this is from, um, I'll probably mispronounce it, 
Zhongyar Jamyang Kyentse Rinpoche, great teacher in his book, What Makes You Not a Buddhist? He writes, fundamentally, it is not the act of leaving behind the material world that Buddhists cherish, but the ability to see the habitual clinging to this world and ourselves and renounce this clinging. So as we become disenchanted in the midst of the transience of our experiences, we are in effect renouncing a kind of clinging to them. We're letting them be. We're letting them come, we're letting them go, but we're not so uptight about it, right? We just, ah, oh, ah. Oh. So maybe what I'll do is offer two more quotations and then open it up for discussion. Uh, the, the point I wanna emphasize here is letting go and more frequently really practicing with a recognition of transience because it's true, right? No experience lasts more than an instantaneous fraction of time before it, it starts to shift into something else. And as you move through your day, see what happens when you just sort of repeatedly recognize many times a day that you are in the middle continually of change. Experience continually changes. And there's no point in trying to hold on to any part of it. To quote the poet Yeats, Yeats, we can make our minds so like still water that beings gather about us, that they may see it may be, their own images, and so live for a moment with a clearer, perhaps even with a fiercer life because of our quiet. What's really interesting is that you let go of what's passing through, you rest in a growing stillness, a growing spaciousness like still water. That's the ground of everything. And here we have a well-known poem from Mary Oliver. Look, the trees are turning their own bodies into pillars of light, are giving off the rich fragrance of cinnamon and fulfillment. The long tapers of cattails are bursting and floating away over the blue shoulders of the ponds. And every pond, no matter what its name is, is nameless now. Every year, everything I have ever learned in my lifetime leads back to this, the fires and the black river of loss, whose other side is salvation, whose meaning none of us will ever know. To live in this world, you must be able to do three things to love what is mortal, to hold it against your bones, knowing your own life depends on it. And when the time comes to let it go, to let it go. That's the poem in Blackwater Woods. So I'd like now to see if there are some questions or comments about what we've explored. I think the simplest thing I'll do is to see if any of you have a comment about impermanence. And I really encourage you to focus on experiential. What helps you let go? That's my question for tonight. What helps you let go? Exhaling, the physical gesture of opening the hand, the recognition that there's a greater happiness in letting go, all these help me let go. What helps you let go? So anybody have a comment? You can push the raise hand button or you can just raise your hand as I bounce through the screens. I see Bill and I'll call on you in a second, Bill, there you are. 
And then just so you know, I'll tend to prioritize people we don't we haven't heard from in the past. And also, um, I ask that you make your comments succinct. Okay, great. So, Bill. Well, you know, I'm just really troubled trying to figure out which is the joke I want to give right now. So I'll only <laughs> give one joke and then a, a rather serious comment, which might be viewed as a joke by some, but isn't. Okay, here's the thing. I was at a, a talk and uh, the, the presenter was talking about three to five billion years from now when the, the, the sun will engulf in the earth and everything will come to an end. After that, a man got up and he said, you know, let's see, now you said that was going to, this would be in three billion years, right? He said, yes. Oh, wow. I thought it was, I thought you said, I thought you said three million years. Now, you know, the problem <laughs> of giving jokes is everybody's mute, so I can't hear <laughs> any response. Okay, but, good. Thanks, Bill. <laughs> now, All right. Here's the thing. How about disenchantment with all the good things that come to one? Compliments, hmm. praise, hmm. awards. So, there's, Bill, how do you practice with that? There's enchantment there, too, and actually it's not a loss. So how do you practice with that, Bill? How do you practice with letting go? Well, I know, I know you changed the question on me in, in, in midstream. I, I don't have a good answer there. I, I haven't thought about that. Yeah. The, 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 it is true I'm finding in my later years that uh, yeah. everything is looser for me. The winds are, are there. The winds are more than they ever were. Yep. The losses are there too. And, and, it, and it, I think there is a certain, I have a sense that my, my grasping and, and clinging to any of it is, is severely diminished. And, and maybe disenchantment is, is, the, is the word for that. Yeah. Well, Bill, let me, let me reply to that and also to uh, some questions that have come in or comments that have come in for people, because you hit on something, which is, you know, disenchantment from what is pleasurable. Like, why would we want to be disenchanted with what is wholesome and enjoyable, right? And um, see for yourself, but my feeling of this material and what you see as a recurring theme and what the Buddha's teaching is a fundamental equanimity with both pleasure and pain. And a seeing through of the allure of pleasure. Enjoy it while also recognizing its emptiness. In other words, the ways in which it is foamy and insubstantial as an experience and not enduring. That really helps us. And what I can report for myself um, and I think other people can describe it as well, is that <clears throat> remarkably and paradoxically, as we um, get deeper, really, in this sense of disenchantment, and we, we kind of let go, we let go into something that feels very peaceful and very enduring and ultimately transpersonal, it seems is kind of wild. It's sort of like letting go of ordinary experience and having the courage to do that, which whew, rem remarkably drops us into this fundamental peaceful well-being. Wow. Okay. So I want to call on first Keith and Baker, then Julian Smith. We'll just do this. Here you go, Keith. Keith, I'm unmuting you. Come on, button. Uh, button is, Keith, I don't know why I can't unmute you. What is going on here? How's that? There you are. Okay, good. Okay, good. Thank you. I found it very interesting, your comment about experiences existing for only a moment, because after that, if they remain, you've turned them, they've become something else than the experience yeah. that you recognize initially. I find that uh, really interesting, but I have a question about it. Um, and I really, it, that concept is really helpful to me because the word impermanence is, you know, is too all encompassing or general, yeah. but 
that idea is interesting to me, but I have a question. Is it always bad um, to retain that experience, even though retaining it is turning it into something else, if it can be used as an instructional moment for future reference rather than something that you dwell on. Right. Thank you for saying that, Keith. You've, you've gotten right at a question that I find deeply interesting and is at the heart of a lot of my own work on taking in the good and the balance of cultivation, the cultivation of mindfulness, the cultivation of loving kindness, you know, the cultivation of wise view, wise intention, and so forth. How do we uh, engage a process in this life of cultivation while simultaneously recognizing impermanence, right? And appreciating impermanence, exactly right. And what I, what I think is the case is that we can do both. In other words, we can wisely realize that it will serve us to sort of be intimately receptive to a particular experience like an insight into impermanence, uh, ironically, we can help stick around. Similarly, um, we can you know, really help it land when we feel cared about and loved by others uh, to satisfy that longing in our heart and to, and to feed that hunger so it's not so hungry the next time, right? So there's, a, there's certainly a place for that. And in the process of cultivation, we can also have vipassana. We can also have insight into impermanence. We can, in other words, both are, both are true. And um, the way that works for me is that I recognize that reality is, temp or this moment of now is infinitely thin temporally, and yet it can leave lasting traces behind. For example, the drop of rain falls on the hillside in any single moment. You know, you can divide the moments into smaller and smaller instants. Uh, eventually, you get down to something that, you know, becomes so thin, it doesn't, it, it approaches the limit of existing at all. But that said, clearly, the drop of water landing on the hillside, instant after instant after instant, as it rolls down the hillside, can leave a furrow behind. And in much the same way, um, our experiences can leave lasting traces in us. So for me, what's kind of remarkable is to have a felt sense of the vanishingness of this moment, even as I know in my physical body, it's leaving valuable traces behind in terms of the cultivation of various positive qualities to develop. And that can all sound very conceptual. I'm using ideas, you know, to kind of explain it. But when you come into it, you, you feel it. And, and for me, it, it, it really has a sense of like the whoosh and the wow. <laughs> you know, you're in, you're in the receptive moment while knowing that you have an animal body that's physical and you're trying to help lasting residues sink in, right? So, so both are really true. Okay. All right, Julian. Colin Julian here. Here we go. Julian, you're unmuted. How are you doing? Yeah, good. Um, I'm, uh, I'm going to try to make this quick. I hate to follow up a joke with kind of a very serious discussion, but um, my therapist uh, this weekend sent me a uh, video by um, Vessel van der Kolk, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with, um, uh, where he was talking about uh, mental health during the COVID-19 pandemic, and he was laying out the preconditions for trauma and what he says uh, is you know, the what he lays out is the preconditions are lack of, lack of predict predictability, immobility, loss of connection, numbing out, and spacing out, loss of sense of time and sequences, loss of safety, loss of sense of purpose. And I think when you <clears throat> look at those preconditions, you can see that that's what we're kind of all experiencing as we're kind of going through the current crisis. But I'm gonna flip that a little bit. Um, you know, uh, I think this, uh, on Monday, right, uh, I saw, and, and maybe some of the people saw, I hope they didn't, that video of those four cops in Minneapolis that killed that dude, George Floyd, right? Yeah. Uh, if you watch the video, I hope you don't, but if you do watch the video, you can like literally see the dude die 
in the video, like four yeah. minutes in, you can die, and for literally four or five minutes straight, you, you're literally seeing a dead man with a cop's neck on his throat. It's very difficult to watch, and yeah, yeah. I'm to watch. Don't recommend anybody watching it, um, but it, it is out there. And <clears throat> looking at the preconditions for trauma that Bessel van der Kolk listed out when he's talking about the COVID-19 pandemic. You can also apply those to what I see is the trauma that's faced every day by a demographic of society who are being, you know, uh, uh, terrorized basically right. by our law enforcement, this kind of systemic racism in the nation, you know, lack of predictability. I, I don't know when mm -hmm. I'm going to. I, I, I'm unable to move out of this situation, immobility, loss of connection, yeah. people not understanding my plight, et cetera, right? Yeah. Right now in Minneapolis, it's um, exploding. I don't know if you're watching the news, but it's no. blowing up up there. It's exploding and there's riots. People are saying it's going to be the next Ferguson. Mm. Uh, it's a powder cake situation out there. And I think that people in that community are lashing out the, you know uh, 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 they're, they're traumatized right yeah and, and they're lashing out and so when we talk about impermanence you know uh, I get it from a philosophical perspective but like when you look at a community of folks that are being traumatized right in the present now with the, our police force and the way society is, but also right. like uh, not black, very impermanent, right? Black people in this country, you know, like transgenerational trauma, you know, epigenetic gene, gene expression of yeah. traumatic stress, right? There is no when when it's just the way society is and has been for right many years or so. Like it's hard to say, well, this will pass, right? Because we've seen killings of black men in the last three months, you know, not to mention just the whole history of killings by police or the whole history of the country, yeah. right? How do you tell this group of folks that feels terrorized, there are, they are traumatized by what's happening to them in society that this too shall pass. That's kind of what I sort of struggle with a little bit with, that idea of impermanence, because I get it. Right. You know, it's easy to say that when you're talking about a pandemic because a virus goes away. Systemic racism doesn't go away. Yeah. Well, Jillian, I'm, I'm going to be reflecting on your comment and question long after this evening's meditation <laughs> has wrapped up. Really, seriously, and I really appreciate you bringing it up. And it's, it's haunting and true. And uh, I think of the time of the Buddha, which had terrible conditions in it. Plagues, wars, slavery, uh, terrible, you know, structural inequality of all kinds. Um, so what in the world was he talking about, right? And... my own just kind of lived reflection on what you're saying here <clears throat> is that it seems true, clearly true, that all of our experiences have a dynamic vibrating nature to them. Even if there's a certain stability to them, when you look closely, there's this sort of dynamic quality and that seems true. And I, I think the Buddha is saying that it's also it's useful to recognize that because it helps us lighten up about our experience, you know, just just that itself. Now that's different from the statement that everything in the world is impermanent because many things are not impermanent, right? The past is permanently the past, you know that that man who was killed will now always be dead. That's permanent, right? It will, it's permanent that that happened. There are many things. And, and so for me, what the Buddha is trying to 
teach here, which is such a deep, deep theme in Buddhism. And then we see for ourselves if it's a useful one for us. Is the ref, is the ref, is insight into impermanence useful for someone? That's a question for each of us to answer in our way. But that I don't think he's trying to say something like, oh, this too will pass, or it's all for the best, or oh, you know, uh, it was meant to be. I, I don't think he's saying that at all. And um, and I think it's always, of course, important to be careful about the uses to which ideas are put, rhetoric is put, right? And um, <clears throat> to be careful about, for example, in in India, the notion of reincarnation and you'll have a better life in the next one and so forth, you know, that idea can be put to the use of trying to have people be passive about or um, fatalistic about or somehow blame themselves for the oppressive conditions in which they live. That's not good. That's not good at all, you know. So, as I said, I'm going to be reflecting on this one for quite a while. I don't have any kind of a glib summary about it. Uh, I have a lot of respect for the reality that you're speaking to and, and you know, and, and what you've said here. Uh, I mean, the only, the only, well, I'm ask, yeah. probably asking for myself, but also, you know, I, I have aspirations of yeah. being a teacher to those folks in that community. And I struggle with like, what would I say to, to a group of people that are experiencing this? You know what I mean? Like yeah. when, I, when I'm seeing the, the reaction going on, it's like, how do, how do you calm that down? Well, I'm not, I mean, of course, then should it be calmed down and then, right, right, right. you know, how do we practice and why do we practice? Um, let me pause here for a moment. Because, of course, I've never lived through that myself. I've never had to deal with that myself. You know, I don't know if this is like a Dharma teacher approved response, but it's what I'm going to say. And it's that it seems really clear to me that there are many horrible conditions that have tremendous inertia, tremendous stability and momentum, and that the shadow cast by terrible things that have happened in the past, right? Slavery in the Americas, for example, um, just are still with us today. It's the wound that doesn't stop bleeding, still with us today. And that's the truth. That's really the truth. And um, maybe the one thing I could offer when I kind of reflect on uh, this, it's that when, as an individual, I think, I would offer this as an individual becomes more comfortable in their own skin, which means becoming more comfortable with the instability, the, the instability, the groundlessness of our experience, which is so unsettling and unnerving that people tend to be motivated to try to hold on to one thing or another, right? But when people really become more comfortable with that and the, the inherently sort of dynamic, you know, nature of their own consciousness, uh, I think they become more fearless and more prepared to name strongly and to fiercely oppose even things that are terrible. And they, they seem to go together somehow to me that that comfort, that, that clear seeing of one's own nature and uh, lightening up about it that comes through this disenchantment and non-clinging actually enables us to be freer and more potent in social action. And I draw strength from people who for me are exemplars of that, notably Thich Nhat Hanh and the Dalai Lama. And I'm sure there are many, many other examples. Nelson Mandela, for me, much the same way. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., much the same way. Somehow there was an inner freedom in their, in their core as they dealt with external oppression. And 
Uh, I've never had to deal with that kind of oppression myself. I don't, you know, privilege means not having to take things into account. There's so much I don't have to take into account that comes from privilege, right? Um, and um, so I just, I guess I just offer this as a thought and um, I'm gonna be haunted by your question and comment in a good way, you know, and I'm gonna reflect on it. So thank you very much, Julian, really, yeah. Some things are just so messed up. They're just so messed up. So, well, we're gonna need to move on now. So, yeah. I'm, yeah, yeah, I know, like, wow, no good, no good. That's right, that's exactly right. I'm glad you brought it up, really yeah. brought, brought it up. Um, and, you know, and there are other many, many examples of that, like people, who are losing loved ones at this time or afraid of that, or I'm thinking of losses I've had in my life. And I'm not saying they're the same as what you're bringing up. I'm That's just thinking fair. about how we can hold things that are permanently screwed up, right? Yeah. Um, how, and I guess I could just sit, say from my own experience, that being aware of the, the foaminess, as I've said, and the inherent dynamism in my own experience somehow helps me bear the horribleness of some things better. So, okay. Well, uh, we're moving beyond our time and um, I wanna say, Tarane, are you there somewhere, anywhere? Tarne, I think what I'm going to do is not make an announcement that we were going to make, but we'll figure out something different about this. And um, I want to say right now, obviously, that um, this is a heavy reality that Julian has pointed us to. Um, and it speaks really, really broadly, in addition to the particular um, huge kind of issues he brought up. Just more generally, how can we live with um, loss and injustice and terrible things, large and small? What helps us do that? And how might we practice with the recognition of the impermanence of our experiences in a way that's useful for us? So I think that's a really fundamental and very, very deep question. <laughs> 